Okay. Thank you all for coming to the seminar. We have uh, at least three fire exits in this room. Mm -hmm. Supposed to be now. And if you want to use the bathrooms, there are the men's room on that side, woman in this uh, hallway. Do you guys have cell phones? <laughs> How many of you have them? <laughs> okay, turn them off. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Otherwise, you shall all be fined on your exam. Right. <laughs> and there is a. You guys need to fill up the uh, surveys that are there in your chair. I guess you don't have one, right? And there's a sign-in sheet where you guys take a photo to make sure that you sign in. That uh, I would like to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Garud Ayanga. He's going to talk about uh, managing systemic risk, which is a very important topic for our institute as we do build complex systems. Um, Gary, he got his uh, PhD from uh, Stanford. He's a professor in the Industrial Engineering and Operations Research Department in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Columbia University. Uh, he got his uh, BTEC in Electrical Engineering from IIT Kanpur and both masters and PhD from Stanford. And I heard that he's worked under uh, Thomas Kowa. He's very well known in information theory. Uh, his research interests are broadly in information theory, control, and optimization. His uh, published work spans a diverse range of fields, including information theory, applied mathematics, computer science, operations research, uh, economics, and financial engineering. His current projects focus on the areas of large-scale portfolio selection. It's quite important if you want to make money. Systemic risk management. We don't want to get into the dollar day type problems and quantitative marketing, smart grades, public health, and systems biology. So, wide range of interest. And I had an excellent uh, conversation here in the morning. So, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Your campus is really beautiful. I spent yesterday afternoon exploring and running around your lake. Uh, it's a very different campus from uh, Columbia. <laughs> to say the least. Okay. What I'm going to do today is walk you through three different projects that I had, all centering around systemic risk. Uh, I wasn't quite sure where to pitch or what, was, what to assume in terms of the audience. So uh, what I'm going to do is give you an overview. Uh, Michelle has three papers that this talk is based on. If any of you want to know details, please reach out to her. She should have the links for the papers. I'm going to try to motivate them as we go along, but the, the talk is more mathematical and modeling rather than applications, but they're inspired by application, and I'll tell you where and how things are. So the first thing that I wanted to impress upon you is that, and this is not something that this audience should this audience probably already knows that networks is very important. It's, uh, it introduces some very interesting interconnections and relationships that if you don't model them well, you won't be able to model the risk in that network. So here's a simple quote. Ford went to Capitol Hill in late 2008. Ford was not coming down. This was a company that was doing well. GM and Chrysler were failing. And Ford went in 2008 to push for the rescue of its rivals, GM and Chrysler. GM received $49.5 billion, Chrysler Group received $10.5 billion in terms of bailout fund, and the CEO of Ford was pushing the government to do this. And the under this was sort of one of many things that we were thinking about around the time that we were thinking about this, this research. Why is it that an entity that actually stands to gain by its competitors going down in the market would push for, that and for its competitors to be living? And the basic story turns out that without financing during bankruptcy, GM and Chrysler would have to go out of business, taking down many of its suppliers. The same suppliers actually also supplied Ford. So if the suppliers went down, 
Ford's capability to make cars would go down. So the connection, if you open the hood, these three companies that on one level look like competitors, at another level they are interconnected because they are they're being given the same parts. And as a result, if you want to understand what's happening, say, in the automotive industry as a risk perspective, it's not enough to think only in terms of what these three entities are, but also the underlying connections. So just I'll give you a, a definition, and then we'll move on to looking at things. I want to understand what's the risk involved in a system. To me, a system is a collection of entities. These entities are connected in some way. Firms in an economy, business units in a company, suppliers, subcontractors in a supply chain company. This was sort of the setting of the Ford example. There are ultimate buyers of these products, but there's a supply chain that's sending up. And I want to understand what the risk of that entire entity is. Generating station, transmission lines in a power network, or more generally, any kind of resource network, you will have a situation. So systemic risk refers to the risk of the entire system. It involves simultaneous analysis of outcomes across all entities and perhaps complex interconnections. The real thing why I'm interested or why one should be interested in systemic risk is that it's the interconnections that create the risk. If the risk was coming from the entities, we generally have a fairly good understanding of what the risk of those entities are. It's the interaction that creates situations which you cannot capture clearly. So here's another little example that was motivating us when we were thinking. So around 2008, there was all this talk about why did the crisis happen? One story of the crisis was Lehman Brothers, which was one of the companies that went bankrupt. It was part of a network of financial companies that owed money to each other. So basically what happens in a financial network is that I, wa I'm, I want to raise some capital. I will give you my securities. You will give me money. I can use that money to buy the securities in the market. Then I'll take these securities and perhaps give it to a different banker who would give me some other money and so on. So these are interbank loans that are effectively created. So this is the network <coughs> on the left-hand side. All the blue dots refer to firms here. So there is cross-firm lending going on. And the bi-directional arrows basically means that there might be lending going both ways. Different divisions of a firm might be looking at different lending each other. Now, if one of those nodes falls, then all its loan obligations are gone. And suddenly, other entities, which were generally considered to be solvent, have a problem. Because they were solvent, because they were expecting incoming flows from this other node. That incoming flow is gone. And now they're insolvent. There was a competing theory at the same time, which was that it wasn't because of interbank lending at all. It was because of the assets that the firms were holding. So on that network, you have two different kinds of dots. Red dot stands for asset. Blue dot stands for firms. Assets. Firms are buying assets. Assets. One of the assets went down. So let me actually put this quote down. In February 2012, there was a quote in op-ed piece in Peter, by Peter Vallison in Wall Street Journal. None of these firms are weakened by its exposure to Lehman or anyone else. Left-hand network is not the right way to think about it. What happened, they were all weakened by the fact that virtually all of them held large amounts of toxic assets. What were the toxic assets? Subprime mortgages. People suddenly thought that the value of subprime mortgage was low. So let's think of a situation. Let's say that this note, and I'll quickly go back. So let's say that this note is a subprime mortgage. All of these firms are invested in that subprime mortgage. Typically, these firms are leveraged, meaning that they borrow money and invest in the market because they want to amplify their gains. Value of this guy goes down. The creditors of these firms, so let's say this guy, is actually not holding any of these assets. So this guy is sitting pretty. Nothing has happened. But these three firms have creditors that are asking for money. When they ask for money, when the creditors ask for money, these three firms already know that this guy, this asset is already depressed. You can't sell any more of it. There's nobody willing to buy. It's toxic. So what do they go? They go and sell these two assets, which were generally fine. But just because they start selling those assets, this firm that never invested in this toxic asset thought that this toxic asset was really toxic and didn't want it, suddenly is exposed to enormous amount of risk because these two guys, their prices go down. So both of these are mechanisms by how mechanisms for spreading risk from one entity to another. This one is more direct through cross-firm cross lending. The second one to your, to your right is uh, 
is something that is mediated by assets. And the exercise that we wanted to do was really to understand how can I think about risk being generated from these interconnections of networks. And I'm going to talk to you very briefly about three different approaches that we have taken. Uh, I apologize up front that I'm not going to be going into details. I'm going to give you an overview of what I want to achieve in these pieces. And then if you want more detail, hold it for, hold it for questions or read the papers. The first approach is a very direct approach. Portfolios are known. I know what these entities are holding, whether they are supply chains or they are financial entities. I know what their decisions are. I know what I'm going to do is generate scenarios from distributions. The distributions of these scenarios are also known, just the realization is unknown. And what is the main story that I wanted to, what I want to capture there is how do I take the apportion, this entire risk that this network has to these entities? How they together, because they are interconnected, create more risk than they were if they were not connected. What I want to do is take that entire risk and say, 50% of risk is because of entity one, 25% entity two, 3% entity four, and so on. So that's a very limited goal. It's very static. Nothing is happening. The only thing that is happening is realizations happen, and I want to look at how do I look at risk. The second piece is we're going to go to stylized dynamical models. Here, the portfolio update rules are known. So I know that when there is a crisis, you won't hold the same portfolio that you're holding right now. You will change. But how you would change is already predetermined. There is a policy in place. Realizations happen. And now I'm going to want to understand what happens in that case. And the goal of exercising this dynamic model was to understand what are the characteristics of resilient networks. If you were a regulator and you could look at the balance sheet of a particular company or you could look at the supply chain of a particular company, what kind of questions do you want to ask? How should the network look for you to be able to say that in crisis, one network is better than another network? The last piece is feedback analysis. Here we are going to be using something called sign directed graphs. This is coming from Venkat's work, uh, because some of you knew Venkat. Um, and there our goal was to model feedback. And the analysis, the goal of the analysis there is to look at particular networks, not about general networks, but give more detailed answers about those general networks, those, those particular networks that you end up getting. So I'm going to go in that order because in some sense, it becomes more applied as we go through, and in, in also it becomes more specialized as we go through. So here's the setting that I'm interested in. Um, I have a bunch of nodes of a network. There are firms, suppliers, edges in a graph, and so on. There's a random loss that happens in a particular node. X tilde script F is the random loss of the entire network. And what I'm interested in is creating a risk measure, which takes that random loss of the network and creates a number to it. It assigns a number saying, this is the amount of risk. As you could very well imagine, absolute numbers don't matter here. It's relative numbers. So we will normalize it at some point to say that for a particular network, I'm going to arbitrarily define the risk to be one. And everything else will be measured with respect to it. The next important thing is to allocate this total risk to each of the entities in the network. And I want to allocate this in an incentive compatible form, <clears throat> meaning that typically these entities become part of the network and the regulator decides to give them risk. But if they, if they think that they're being assigned too much risk or too little risk, too little risk, they like it. But if they are being assigned too much risk, they might decide that they don't want to be regulated by this regulator anymore. And so you need to be incentive compatible. This research was motivated because right after 2008, when the financial crisis happened, People started suggesting all kinds of risk measures. So if you look at the dates, so Lehars was before the crisis, Huang was 2009, Acharya 2010, Brownlee's 2010. They started saying, look, here's how you should measure systemic risk. The bottom one is something called deposit insurance. So these are the total losses in each of the firm in each of the scenarios. You take the positive part of it, which means that you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot add the, uh, gains and losses. You take only the losses, add them up across the network, and this star stands for the fact that you take the expectation with respect to a risk-neutral measure. Uh, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Just think of it as an expectation. This one says, well, forget about the positive part. I can actually add across the firms, 
and then take the conditional value at risk of that. In some sense, these are both arbitrary. There is nothing special about the first one or the second. And the motivation that we started thinking about this problem was, why would you want something like this? How can I argue that there is a basic set of axioms that makes these, or risk measures of this form, the only ones that are possible? Turn it another way around, is to say that suppose somebody comes up with this kind of a risk measure, what are the implicit assumptions they are making about the underlying risk? Once we understand that, then in addition to this, I can suggest other things. That's one. Both of these are about financial risk. If I understand the underlying structure, perhaps I can go beyond financial risk to think about other kinds of risk in engineering systems as opposed to just uh, financial systems. So that was what our goal was. Like I said, this one is this particular discussion is a little bit mathematical. I'll, I'll uh, quickly we'll move to something which is a little bit more tangible. So what we did was we said, all right, I'm going to look at risk in different scenarios. So they have one through capital omega different scenarios. For each of those scenarios, for each of the firms, one through script F firms, there are certain outcomes that are going to come. So this green basically tells you this is a column of outcomes that happen across different scenarios of form T. Similarly, this will be all the risk that happens in a particular scenario, scenario omega one, across all firms. All right? So the risk measure essentially is a function of this matrix. A function, this, if you give me an, this, a matrix of this form, it assigns a number. Now what I want to do is tell you what are the axioms that I want to put on this risk measure. Before I get there, I want to just give you a concrete number. So let's say there are three forms and three future scenarios equally likely. Here are scenario ones, I mean scenarios one, two, three, form one, two, three. And these are the outcomes of these firms in these different scenarios. Plus refers to a gain, uh, minus refers to a loss. So sorry, the other way around. Plus is a loss, negative is a profit. All right. They have the same three numbers, 50, minus 40, 20, permuted around. And if you think about these firms for a moment, I'll just leave them while I keep talking, for you to see whether intuitively, which of these three firms should be riskier. There's one firm which is riskier than the other two. And we want to be able to capture in some theory that this is going to happen. Okay, so the question we want to ask is, what is the total risk of this economy? And how does one allocate this risk to the three firms? And we're going to make some assumptions about what the risk measure should have. <clears throat> so I'm going to assume, so these are all properties of this risk measure, rho. It's a mapping which takes a matrix and gives me a real number. I'm going to assume that it should be monotonic. Remember, x's are losses. So if you give me a matrix x, which is component-wise larger than matrix y, then any risk measure which is reasonable should be assigning more risk to x than y. Non-controversial. In every scenario of the world, in every firm, you're making more risk, more losses. Second piece, this is controversial, positive homogeneity. <clears throat> if I multiply all the losses by a real number alpha greater than or equal to zero, the risk that I get scales linear. This is controversial. And this is controversial because of too big to fail scenario. We are basically saying if I double the scale of the company, I get double the risk. Typically, that's not true. It becomes more than double the risk. But we can drop this. We can make this convex and things would be okay. And at the end, I'll tell you some extensions. Normalization, this is what I was saying, that the absolute numbers don't matter. So I'm going to take an economy where there is a loss of one in every state of the world for every firm and just define it to be script F. That's just a normalization. It doesn't affect anything. The controversial part comes from here. So think about that this risk measure actually induces a preference between the outcomes. I'm going to say that if every scenario of the world, I prefer x to y, then the risk that I should impose to x must be greater than the risk that I impose to y. And then two kinds of convexity, outcome convexity, and I apologize, I'm Pretty sure all of you are not processing this in real time, but that's okay. I'll come to the punchline and then I'll tell you what's going on. Um, I'm going to assume that there are two kinds of convexity. There's something called outcome convexity, which means that if I 
add the outcomes, then I get a convex, then the risk measure is convex in the outcomes. Risk convexity, which means that if I look across scenarios, they both, the way to think about it is that both of these convexities, at least in financial setting, is connected to diversity of some sort. The outcome convexity allows cross-subsidization, meaning that I can subsidize from one economy to another, and if I'm allowed to do that, I lower risk. The other one, which is the second one, says I can remove randomness, and whenever I remove randomness, I lower risk. Uh, think about in the simulation world, whenever you average, you remove risk. Whenever you're trying to simulate when some part of the randomness has been removed, you again reduce the risk. You reduce variability. Suppose you were to make all of these assumptions. Then you end up getting a theorem which says that every risk measure which satisfies all of those assumptions can, must be constructed with two pieces. An aggregation function, lambda, that aggregates risk across forms in a particular scenario, and a function rho that takes this aggregated risk and assigns it a number. So what's going on here is that lambda x1 would basically take this form and figure out what its risk is across the different scenarios. Here's a different, across. this is for the second scenario and the third scenario and so on, and this is capital omega scenarios. And then this function rho zero takes this capital omega numbers and gives me a real number. Why do I care about all of this? The reason I care about all of this is that if you look at the two risk measures that I told you in the beginning, they both are of this form. In one case, I take the aggregation function is just the total. In the other case, the aggregation function is the positive part of the losses. In every scenario, you add across the firms what happens. You use a different function there. And then you compound it with the conditional value at risk kind of function over there, an expectation over here. I'm sure you lost, I lost you somewhere on slide three, but what I want you to recover from this point, the reason we wanted to do this was to understand that if you're using a risk measure of this form, implicitly you're assuming that the underlying random <laughs> satisfies all of those axioms. If you think that any one of those axioms doesn't make sense to you, for example, if the positive homogeneity doesn't make sense to you, or the convexity doesn't make sense to you, then you're not, you should not be using any of these methods because they automatically satisfy those properties. So this, the, the punchline of this exercise was two. One, given the axioms, now I can go and construct other risk measures. Here are different examples. This is a resource allocation risk measure. Before we did this theory, people hadn't thought of how to construct a risk measure here. Now we can construct risk measures that are built on linear programs. Why? Because I know that this linear program is convex in the right-hand side here. As long as it's convex in this right-hand side, I can construct a risk measure doing that. I can do another risk measure. Eisenberg and No came up with a contagion model, which is a very popular contagion model. I can construct for you a risk can measure. Sure? Sure. Yeah. So this is basically <clears throat> Simple knapsack type problem, but yes, it's a, no it's way. actually even a continuous knapsack problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a single okay. Yeah, it's just uh, regular linear program. Yeah. so it's it's actually it's a linear program, but it, it's sort of like it a is. covering type linear. Program. Okay. Yes, question. Why do you want to start with scenarios? Sorry, why, why do, do I start with scenarios? Because uh, you have scenarios, you have underlying probabilities. Yes, so you can. Uh, so let me jump forward. Uh, you can do anything that you like. Uh, the reason we started from scenarios was that the mathematics was easier. Uh, the underlying math for showing convergence of various kinds, showing that existence of functions was easier. It was just linear algebra. Um, when, I, when I wanted to understand from going from axioms to risk functions, I now could construct just using linear algebra. Uh, whereas if I wanted to go for general probability spaces, I had to use much more involved fun functional analysis. But you can extend it. But you can extend it. All the story extends, you'll have to make, for every extension that you make, you'll have to make some regularity assumption. You'll have to make sure that your random variables. So when I do the story in terms of matrices, I don't have to assume anything. They are real numbers. Everything is fine. When I go to probability spaces, I'll have to assume that things are tight. 
It doesn't run off to infinity in any direction. Some regularity assumptions have to be made. And, and those have to be particular. It, uh, I, I don't have a general answer for that. OK. Uh, all right. So this was one part of the story that you can, you can now start constructing risk measures for anything you like, essentially. Anytime you can write an optimization problem for what is happening in the system, I can construct for you a risk measure. You're, design, you're optimizing a supply chain, automatically you get a risk measure. You're doing power systems, you get a risk measure. In this case, you're trying to look at what happens in a market, in an interbank lending setting, you can get a risk measure. So that was one advantage of looking at it from a purely mathematical perspective. The other thing that happens is that because everything has been set up as a nice convex optimization problem, I have duality. Once you look at duality, you can write the same risk measure as if it's maximizing over some dual variables. So these dual variables live, have two indices, one corresponding to the firm and the other corresponding to the scenario. In the case where the scenarios are infinite, this will not be a sum anymore, but an integral, but it extends. So then what you can do is that you can just take the sum over the scenarios and you end up getting a risk that is attributed to a particular firm. Now, there is a theorem, I mean, this is great, but there's also another theorem which says that this has something called a no undercut uh, property, which means that these firms, if they decide to break away from this regulator and form their own set of systems, the allocation that they would be given under my system, which is under this regulator Y star, is going to be less than what they could get individually. So there is no incentive for the firm to leave this system and create a sub-network of their own. This is important, particularly if you want, if the regulator wants to impose something and it's, it's treated, it's assumed to be fair. This is a generalization of the attribution scheme of Oman Shapley, Dino, and uh, Burf, Butch and Dorfleitner, which had come around the time of the risk, uh, around the financial crisis. Okay, so if you take these three firm, three scenarios equally likely phenomena, and you use something called the conditional value at risk, and just add up the risk, it turns out that the risk attribution is 20 over 3, 20 over 3, 50 over 3. Does that make sense? Does firm 3 look riskier than firm 1 and 2? Intuitively, what could be, why did it, why would it assign more risk to firm 3? <clears throat> Essentially, what happens is that firm 3's largest loss, remember plus numbers are losses, yeah. 50, happens when firm 1 and 2 also have uh, medium losses. Whereas the largest losses for firm 1 happens when firm 2 is having its most gain. Largest loss of firm two happens when firm one has its most gain. In fact, both of these firms are having its most gain. And its largest losses, I mean, I guess it's medium loss. So therefore, these two firms are symmetric, and this firm ends up being the asymmetric largest loss firm. So it's, it's, you can get some nice results out of it in terms of intuitively appealing. Um, you can start, once you know what is going on in terms of the risk measure, you can start peeling off different things. You can say monotone, positively homogeneous preference, consistent, not convex. What happens then? You can get a prescription. Monotone, convex, preference, consi preference consistent, not positively homogeneous. You can get a risk measure from there. So you can start peeling out various assumptions and ended up, end up getting nice results about what's going to happen to the underlying risk measure. Yes. There are two pages before. So the results... It's because of what? It's beyond the incentive compatibility, but because convexity or? Yes, it's basically convexity. Because there is, so what happens is that this is a peculiar, uh, where did it go? These two different convexities, <clears throat> there are two kinds of convexities that are underlying that function. These two convexities together give me that undergrad property. So single, I think we can talk offline uh, You can go to general probability spaces. It has been extended. You can go to general risk measures. Uh, you can go to set valued risk measures, all of which. So right now I'm talking about the row function actually giving an output of a number. But there is no reason for it to be a number. You can give a set as the output. And all of these extensions have been done. Uh, some of it was 
I'm, I'm quoting some of it, which we did, which was this one. But the best paper in this uh, came in 19, uh, 2014 by Cromer, Overback, and Zilch. Uh, and that's probably the best one in, in this area of general probability spaces. Essentially, the point is, the most general thing that you can think about can be done, but at every step of the way, somewhat, some of the applicability goes away. Uh, some of the intuitive feel for it goes away. All right. Okay. Can you replace the controversial assumptions? Yes. So we can do we can do it in. So the answer to that question is that we can remove convexity, but we'll have to in that case keep positive homogeneity. We can remove positive homogeneity, but have to keep convexity. But how about the original axioms? One of those. Yes. So these are the original. These are. Monotone, positively homogeneous, preference consistent, convex. These are the four axioms that we started with. Positively homogeneous is controversial. Convexity is controversial. So the answer to your question is I can't remove both of them. If I remove both of them, there are just too many functions. Essentially, anything can happen, which is not very useful. But I can remove them one by one. I can keep convexity and remove positive homogeneity, or I can keep positive homogeneity and remove convexity. In both cases, we get some nice results. But if you remove both of them, then essentially you can do anything you like. So you don't get any structural result. You don't get something interesting there. So the game here is that you want to have risk measures that is a big set, but not all functions. Because if it's all functions, then you're not getting anything particular about them. All right. I'm going to now make a change of, change of gears. I have until two, right? Mm -hmm. So... The, up to until now, we are taking something what the financial industry would call a risk management approach, which says, you choose your portfolios, we'll give you scenarios, and we'll test it and see what happens. So that was the setting that we had. Uh, Xs are already exogenously known. The only thing I'm trying to figure out is how do I map that X, known X, to a number. But in crisis, we know that whatever they were doing before, they're not going to keep on doing the same thing. That's, I mean, by the very definition, crisis means that it's not business as usual. So they're going to change something. They're going to not behave in the same manner. So whatever we did before is great for normal circumstances. It's not great for when the crisis has happened or is happening. So we want to go to the next step, which is to say that instead of being completely exogenously given, we will give the rules are given but outcomes are endogenously selected in the market. The other thing that happened was that we were thinking about just firms. Now we want to look at, look at what happens in commonly held assets. In the previous uh, development, we, it was just firms that were playing a role. Now I want to throw in assets. And to the extent that I throw in assets, this has become a more particular story. I can't apply this to a power generation setup. It has, it has now become a story about financial markets. Okay, so here's, again, I apologize. There's a bunch of things that are going to happen over the next slides. I'll give you a flavor for what is going on, and then I'll summarize for you and tell you what the interesting things are. So I'm going to think that every firm has some portfolio rules. It says how to invest its fractions. Depending upon what happens to the market, how do I go and invest it? These portfolio rules are going to be dependent on the prices of the assets and some underlying exogenous risk factors. How much money do I have? Uh, not money, sorry. How much loan have I taken? What is the interest rate on that loan? What macroeconomic factors I know and so on. It could also depend on wealth and it's in the paper. Uh, like I said, the links to all the papers <coughs> were given before. Here's an example. If you use something called constant relative risk aversion utility function, then you can write that the portfolio rules are a function of prices, the mean returns, the covariance matrix, and the interest rate. And this is how that rule looks like. Right? Okay. Now we're going to assume that there is market clearing. What does market clearing mean? It means that D is the total number of shares times Q. This is the total wealth that has been available in the market. That must equal pi which is the portfolio rules times the wealth, which is W. You just write it out in a little bit more detail, you end up going down. Now, why is this important? Because you see Q here and you see Q there. 
So the prices of the assets are now endogenously defined through X's, which are the external factors. So if the external risk factors change, this equation still has to hold because markets have to clear, and the price Q will now be determined by what the investors do. So it will not be as what happened pre-crisis, during crisis, things could be different. And that's what essentially what we do. We do an implicit function theorem. You end up getting that because of the implicit function theorem and because of the presence of Q on both sides, you have this matrix inversion that is happening. On the right-hand side, you have something called the direct effect. This is the direct effect because change in portfolio rules, because of the exogenous risk factors, change in wealth during, because of the exogenous factors. So think of this as what will happen to the market without this market clearing present. What market clearing does is that it takes all the actions of all the investors and connects them. Because the price gets determined by what everybody does. So this is what happens to you when you decide to change the rule. But because of the interconnection, now you get this inverse matrix. And I'm going to assume in the next slide that I'm going to assume that this pi is constant. Big picture story that I want you to focus on is the fact that this matrix H becomes zero, and you just have I minus pi theta transpose inverse times something. Whenever, I'm assuming that half of you or most of you are control theorists, whenever you see something I minus state, I minus a matrix inverse, you should immediately think about a geometric series, which means that effectively in the back of my mind, you should be thinking about some kind of amplification happening. There's a feedback going on. Oh, you could use the matrix inversion lemma, right? You could use the matrix inversion lemma, except that these matrices are actually full rank matrices. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily help you much. Um, but the point is, you end up getting writing this as an expansion, and that ends up being very useful. So what happens is, the way I want you to think about this is that something happens to a particular asset. Because of that, it changes, or here it's been written this way. So it starts from J. It, something happens to this matrix because of which the actions of this player changes, which gets, gets impacting some other assets, which goes through and impacts some other player, which comes back in here. So all of these, every one of these edges now corresponds to one of these matrices being multiplied. As you, identity means that there is no relationship between firms and assets. First one means just one edge. Second one means the second edge and keeps going. And so effectively, this impact is being propagated between firms and assets going across. So does pi theta have any, has any structure or not? It does. We, it does have some structure, which has to do with that pi refers to only firms and theta refers only to assets. Okay. But beyond that, we've not been able to find any nice structure there. Uh, the only thing that I can say is that Remember back in the beginning, we were thinking about these models where has the, has the financial crisis come because of Lehman or because of toxic assets? So this one says, if J was a toxic asset and everything was nice, because of these interconnections, now these assets also get dragged down. And these firms, which let's say firm H, which was not invested in J directly, also gets affected. And that's because of these higher order terms that are coming into play. And those higher order terms come into play because of market clearing, because of the way the prices evolve. Okay. Next story. So would both theory hold? Sorry? Would both theory hold? Yeah, it could hold. So you could, for example, in a later work, one of the PhD students who was working on this project end up um, creating, actually what he ended up doing was in addition to this, you put a network on these firms also, which is a just a network of lending. And uh, since you know David Yao, David has a paper where he has put that in. And he allows for the possibility that, let's say, firm H has, has loaned money to firm G. Firm G has gone and invested that money in the assets. And the investment now has gone down. And therefore, firm H, which was sitting pretty, not even in the market. Let's say the firm H has decided to put all its money into treasuries. Because it loaned money to firm G, now ends up getting the impact of the market. So there are models that you could do. Um, in terms of 
in terms of structural insights, it almost looks like a product, meaning that you could do a network of just the firms, you do an asset firm network, and you get some interesting insights from both of these networks. When you put them together, it looks like a product. So it's not as if new phenomena appear. It, it looks, it's the same phenomena, but let's put it this way. The phenomena that happen are predictable based on both those component networks. So in some sense, it doesn't add more. Okay. Next, what we did was, again, uh, not to get too much in details, what we wanted to do was understand that if you look at the holding network, meaning how much is the money invested in asset I from firm H, that depends on the portfolio and it also depends on the leverage ratio. So this is the leverage of a firm. This is the fraction of investment into asset I. They multiply together, gives you pi I H. So you look at X I H and call this the holding network. For feasible economies, meaning economies that make sense, they must satisfy some clearing, market clearing condition. Condition to this market clearing condition, we wanted to understand what kind of holding networks look good. Why would I want to care about this? Because there were two competing theories of what to do in a market. One competing theory would be, let's everybody invest in all companies. Why? Because then the investment in a given asset is going to be a small fraction of the total investment. If this asset goes down, then the impact is low. And it's sort of spread out across the firms, and therefore the risk should be low. The other competing theory is, no, that's not how it should be. You should compartmentalize companies. This set of companies only invest in some assets, this set of companies, another set of assets, this is the third one. So if any one of them asset classes goes down, only one third of the economy goes down, the two thirds of the economy is good. So we wanted to understand, and that all goes down to the interconnection of this matrix X. And we, what we wanted to understand was, how can we decide between these two different economies? The completely interconnected economy and the dis isolated economy. Which one is better? Isolated. So the real answer, <laughs> you should wait for a little. I thought that's what Delman said. <laughs> Again, not give you uh, too much detail. What I want to say is that what we said, all right, the, the spectral radius of the network effect is what is going to matter. How does it blow up things? There is an inverse sitting there, so there is a likelihood that it will blow up things. So let's look at the spectral radius of that network matrix and call that to be our trigger. And what we wanted to do was maximize this with respect to feasible problems. So here's my X, which are, which are feasible networks. Script X, they satisfy a bunch of equalities. I want to minimize this maximal network amplifier over all Xs that are there. So I, I'm a regulator. You tell me you want to invest. I'm going to say these matrices look good to me because they minimize the blow up factor. Okay. Um, what you end up getting is that because this function is actually not convex, you end up getting two different settings. Uh, something called a low leverage economy, in which case this number, which is the minimum of the lambda max, turns out to be less than one. Something called a high leverage economy, where the maximum of the lambda min turns out to be greater than one. So you're minimizing lambda max, there are maximizing lambda min. Both of them, both of these problems are convex optimization problems. Low leverage is when this number happens to be less than one. High leverage is when that number happens to be greater than one. Thankfully, they are separated. I can always look and say either the mar Okay, so what happens is that I can categorize a market as low leverage or as high leverage, but there is somewhere in things in between that I cannot categorize, and I don't know what the right answer is. So think of it as a three-piece story, low leverage, don't know, or middle leverage and high leverage. I have a story for low leverage, I have a story for high leverage. I don't know what happens in the middle. So it turns out that if your market is low leverage. The yeah. theorem, the, you said that the lambda max is less than one, but lambda min is more than one. Correct. So can the theorem be true? No, lambda min is great. Oh, sorry. I've, got, I've gotten them the other way around. Right. So lambda min is... Upper bar is greater than lambda max lower bar. So this, this here is a typo. Okay. But the, and you end up getting this statement to be true, but there is stuff in the middle. Economies for which this is not true and that is not true. Okay. 
So there are economies for which <laughs> lambda min is less than one, and lambda max is less than one. But lambda min is okay. Yeah, but lambda min is greater than lambda max. So they are not necessarily low leverage or high leverage. So it turns out that for low leverage economies, economies where everybody is not borrowing much money, the minimum is given by that quantity, 1 minus lambda max lower bar. And that blows up as lambda max goes to 1. And that bound is achieved by something called a mutual fund economy. The all firms invest in the same portfolio. The risk of the firms are completely pooled. And the risk management is achieved by diversification, meaning all of us have put money into the same set of firms. Amount of money going into any given asset is small. And therefore, it going down is not going to affect. And this is going to be true in situations where we are not leveled, we are not borrowed too much. When it's a high leverage economy, then it turns out that it's completely isolated network, which is going to be better. So in this case, lambda min bar is greater than 1 and is going towards 1 and starts to blow up at that point. And it turns out that in that particular case, the best thing to do is to isolate firms. And you get risk management not by diversification, but by diversity or isolation. So, uh, I'm going to move to yet another little topic, and so I just want to summarize the story here. What we wanted to attempt here was to try to understand how, does, how can we think about a network and look at its risk. Is there a way, at least for financial networks, how can I think of its risk? But not everything is exogenous. I want it to respond to the shocks directly. And what we did here was to go somewhere in that step. We said that the rules are given. So the rules are given. I just don't know what shocks are going to materialize. But given the rules, I can start predicting what is going to be happening to the shocks in an endogenous fashion. And that tells me how the network should be formed in order to minimize risk. It depends. And the answer is actually nice in the sense that not any one given network is good. It depends on what the economy is. If it's a high leverage economy, you need to have one set of networks. If it's a low leverage economy, you have to have a different set of networks. The dissatisfying part is that there is somewhere in the middle, which we don't know what the answer there is. It's probably a combination of these two, but that's there's no nice way of deciding what the combination is. All right. The last piece, and it sort of our work went in chronological order, so it's good that I am chronologically coming there. Um, from the second piece, one of the things that you can easily take away is that systemic risk is the consequence of positive feedback. You are, you, some, a firm does something, it affects the assets, its price goes down, it comes back and affects other firms which can go and affect other assets. So it's a, it's a loop effect that's coming because of positive feedback. And we want to, we wanted, after we got this insight, and it's pretty, it's a reasonably obvious insight. We wanted to understand how can we represent that in a graph. It turns out that networks or directed graphs don't have enough information to identify them. In the sense that graphs have numbers, um, they don't have this notion of direction. And we, we wanted to put on it, put on the graph, this idea of a gradient across that edge. So I have a quantity in the beginning of that edge, I have a quantity at the end of the edge, and I wanted to put on that edge some information about how would, the, what, how would the end of the edge change as I change the input to that edge. So I want to think of that edge almost as a simple input-output device. I put in, and it's a linear input-output device. I put something here. I vary it. I want to understand how the other type varies. Why do I care about this? Because now if I have a loop in the graph and the product across that loop is positive, then a, then a disturbance at that one location is going to propagate and come back, become larger, propagate again, come back, become even larger, and so on. And in order for me to put that gradient information, graphs were not good enough. And this is where uh, Professor Venkat Subramaniam comes into the picture. And he proposed that we should start looking at sign uh, digraphs. This is used in process engineering literature. And I'm sure there are more people here who are more expert than I am. Uh, it extends the analysis from arcs to loops. So we are not talking about arcs anymore. We are talking about what happens across loops. It's a systematic analysis of hazards and instabilities. 
It's somewhere a compromise between full control theoretic analysis and graphs. Graphs don't have this gradient at all. You could do a full PDE or an ODE analysis of the system. Very complicated. You want somewhere in between. And digraphs gives you a way of at least trying to focus attention on particular loops. The other insight that uh, Venkat brought, which is uh, important, is that graphs are good for flows. Think about internet power grids. Bits come in, bits go out. Maybe bits merge, maybe bits split. But bits don't get changed into something else. Whereas in, um, in a financial network, things get changed. Cash comes in, a derivative gets produced. Or cash comes in, a security is bought. So this entities that are being created, they are being, their total value is being preserved, but their nature is changing. And sign digraphs are good for these kind of flow transformation situations. At least they give you a, a good starting point, and that's why we wanted to consider this. Here's a simple example uh, of a continuous stirred reactor, and don't ask me too many details because I'm not a chemical engineer. This is not something that I would know anything about. Uh, Stuff comes in, it's, a reaction happens, so there's, stuff is coming in from here, A gets transformed into B, I'm assuming that this is an exothermal reaction, which means that this thing gets heated up, there's a thermal sensor, and then there is some kind of a mechanism that is trying to keep the temperature at some set point. Okay, here's a sign digraph uh, way of looking at it. CAI is the outside concentration, CA is the inside concentration. The way I want you to think about these solid edges is that when the concentration outside goes up, the concentration inside goes up. So the gradient of this edge is positive. Dotted edges means that it's negative. If the reaction rate, which is R, goes up, the concentration of A goes down because A is being converted to B. Similarly, uh, if the temperature goes up and the set point temperature is the same, the error goes up because of which this quantity Fc goes up and it comes back and pushes the temperature down. In this particular system, there is one positive loop, which is the temperature reaction rate. So when the chemical reaction happens, if concentration of A goes up, the reaction rate goes up because of which temperature goes up. But temperature going up typically pushes the reaction rate up further. So there is a positive feedback here. So this system can potentially go unstable unless you have this negative loop here compensating for this positive. Right? So that's... That's sort of as far as I want you to know in terms of time diagrams. Okay, now we're going to revert back to how I could possibly use this. So here's a picture. Like I said, I was going to go from most general in the beginning to a little less general and now more specific. This is what a prime broker does. It's a hedge fund. It comes to the broker. It gives its securities as collateral and receives loans for cash to go produce other things. It has a finance desk which takes ca which gets cash from a money market fund. In, in So these securities that were given end up going to a money market fund. The cash that comes in here ends up going there. Sometimes it also uses the same cash and tries to go a trading desk which buys stuff from the market. Okay. Again, in real time, in uh, three minutes, I'm not assuming that you will pro process this. This is even more complicated. So what we did, our contribution in this paper was to take this model, which is a fairly high level model, and convert it into a sign diagram. I don't want you to focus too much because I can give an entire talk on this story. The le here's what's, what's happening to the money market fund. Here's the finance desk. Here's the prime broker. Here's the hedge fund. Here's the trading desk. Here's the bank dealer. The point is, why do I focus on this? The reason I want you to know is that if you give me a component like this, of a financial network, or for that matter, any other network, with some degree of ease, I can convert it into a sign diagram. All right. Is this done manually? Um, so in this particular case, it was done manually. Um, but there are some, Venkat has some papers where you can do it automatically. But that's not the important, there's a follow-up question to yours, which is actually more important than the first part. So this part is fairly okay. But remember, what am I going after? I'm going after positive feedback loops because that's what is going to give me instability. So this is great that I was able to translate it into this. Now I have so many loops floating around here. And if I want to look at all possible loops, 
This is a painful exercise. But thankfully, there is an automated way of doing depth first search and getting all the loops, which is a saving grace. So I want to show you what I want to show you is that fire sales. What are fire sales? Fire sales is finding situation happens. Um, because of some reason, the price of an asset drops. Ordinarily, people would want to buy it. But in many situations, once the ad price of that asset drops, people want to sell it even further. Um, the opposite of that is a bank run phenomenon, which is happening in, happened in Europe very recently, where people just wanted to go get their money out because they felt that the bank wouldn't have the money tomorrow, which makes sense to take it out today. But if everybody does what is individually rational for them, which is take money out, it's globally irrational. Um, and so that's another phenomenon. We'll that happened in Connecticut in the CBT. Connecticut exactly. Bank and Trust. Okay. In the 1980s? Um, like, yeah, 1980s and 90s. Something. The savings and loans crisis? Uh, before that, I think they had they done some stupid things. And okay. So I, I went and ran the back. So, so. <laughs> okay. Um, so you are one of the... I'm one of the guys. <laughs> All right. Okay. Took the money out. <laughs> so what happens here is... In this, but if you do the SDG analysis of this, what happens is that there is a positive feedback loop in the system which can potentially cause instability. So think about the following situation. The price in the market goes down. So the, the value of the collateral that's there from the hedge fund goes down. Because of that, the amount of loan that the, the, the company is willing to give goes down. Leverage goes down. Because of the leverage going down, you, the amount of quantity that this hedge fund can hold goes down. It needs to sell, which means the price goes down even further. So this is a positive feedback loop. And all of this is happening primarily because this hedge fund doesn't actually put up all its money to, bu to buy. What it does is that it gets the loan from the prime broker. And the value of that collateral, the money and the security that they are holding goes down because of which the amount of loan that the bank is willing to give to the hedge fund goes down. It cannot hold this asset anymore, so it needs to come down. And when it comes down, it sells it into a depressed market, which brings the price further down, and it ends up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of what happens here. Uh, from my perspective, the thing that I like is that we went from this high-level picture to finding the loops in an automated fashion to discovering that this particular loop, which has a meaning, in terms of fire sale, shows up automatically without looking at the detail, without actually looking for them. There are some other instabilities that are there in the paper that you can take a look at. The other one is this funding run. The, I won't go into the detail. The only thing that I would, I wanted to focus on in this one is that this one, these are all positive edges, but this particular one has two negative edges canceling each other. So this is somewhat, so you could argue at this this particular picture, what's the big deal of SDG? Because you just found a loop for me. What's the big story? I could have done this in graphs without looking at SDG. Plus minus things. Yeah. Exactly. Plus. So here everything was plus. So what's the big deal? What happens here is that you do get phenomena where two minuses cancel each other, meaning that they, they give you a positive feedback loop, even though these were individually going in the opposite direction. And this is where the power of a sign diagram ends up being useful. Um, what also, also it implies to you is just like, um, and then I don't have too much time, so I'm going to quickly go back to this one. If I'm able to add some negative feedback loop of this sort, in order to counteract this positive feedback loop, perhaps we can get stability. And that's one, one such example in the, in the paper, where we say that this particular thing could be stabilized by adding another loop. Um, and that's although that's not automatically done, it's done by hand. All right, so I'm going to stop right here. Three different scenarios or three different stories. One was an axiomatic framework, the other was a structural model, and the third was a sign digraph model. They have their own powers. Uh, if, the, if you want to take away one sort of message from this talk, is that systemic risk is a difficult beast, and if you think that one model is going to solve all of them, it's nearly impossible. It almost has to be done the other way around. And what aspect of systemic risk are you interested in? 
and then perhaps the right model will become clear. It is not going to be one model that's going to give you the answer for systemic risk questions. All right. Thank you so much for your attention. I know Yaka always tells me that Bellman said you've got a highly interconnected networks, they tend to be unstable. <coughs> That's what Bellman said. They are prone to instability because of too many connections, and I'm not sure whether we did not include the fact that we are not even aware of all Some the of connections. So what my theory seems, at least in this piece, in this stylized model seems to suggest, if, that every, if every piece in that network is negligible, then having a larger network generally manages to do things <coughs> well. If, the, if pieces of the network are very significant, then it's better to isolate them. Tightly okay. connected. Tightly connected networks. Tightly connected where each entity is negligible is a good thing. Weakly connected when the entities are very formidable is a good thing. So departments should be made small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, part two does uh, do part two and part three build on part one? No. So so, uh, so I would say you basically said the first part is very general. So I would say that part two start, <coughs> we started looking. Part two was was motivated coming out of part one. And Does it build on the results of part one? Build on the four? <coughs> it builds to the extent that the risks that that um, <coughs> spectral radius measure ha satisfies all the properties that we had before. To that extent, it builds on it. But it's it's much more particular because it's about assets and firms and this market clearing. Whereas the first part is more general. It doesn't tell you. It doesn't ask the question of how does these losses appear. They don't even have to be in dollars. They could be in power loss. They could be in losses in terms of, they could be in different units. So how would Wall Street financial market accept the, the, the results here? So I would say that they would go, this is probably the one that is likely to be accepted the most. Because it's tangible. Because it, it is, it is uh, and this last paper actually appeared, uh, is, was supported by Office, Office of Financial Research, which was created by the Dodd-Frank Bill. One of my collaborators, Richard Bookstaber, used to be at OFR. Actually, Paul Glassman and Richard Bookstaber used to be at, uh, at OFR. And this is an OFR, what shall we call it, uh, recommendation paper now. So this is the piece that they would accept. Not because of anything else, but because I would say that in some sense they would accept it because of this picture. No map, just this picture. Because for them, going from this picture, this picture they accept. Going from that to this, they understand how they came to it. Now if I start to do analysis on this one, they're willing to buy it. On the other hand, if I give you a stylized model, they're going to not accept it. Because... But this is, I think, in some ways, the constant challenge between being an academic and a very applied person. You have to find somewhere in between. Um, if I were to say that every broker looks like this, now there are many of them interacting in the market, and now I want to understand what is that network going to do, it's nearly impossible. I can't tell you anything about it. So I would say that, again, I would stand by this, that depending upon what your ultimate goal is, you should probably choose your model accordingly. <coughs> so is Paul still with uh, business school or Paul left the business school? No, he's at the business school. Okay. And uh, he is also the chief scientific advisor for OFR. Okay. He took a sabbatical and spent two years at OFR, but then is back now. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. How does uh, how does this graph get augmented uh, based on the individual strategies of, of the hedge fund? So what we would do is right here, you won't be able to see it very clearly. So here, basically, we are making an assumption in this particular thing that they are using something called leverage tracking. Um, so they set a leverage level, and they want to track that leverage level. 
So as if you change the, the portfolio or rules that the hedge fund is using, this piece gets changed. If it's super complicated, the graph becomes super complicated and you end up not getting much. But if it's a simple enough set of strategies, you can represent it there and you can get some reasonable things out of it. Right, so I'm, where I'm leading is um, this tool, I think at the surface could be used from, uh, for, from the regulation exactly. side of it. But hedge funds are also tend to be very secretive. Sure. Um, so, <coughs> what can you do from the uh, from the regulatory side versus Correct. from the hedge fund side? Very good question. Now, I can tell you what is being done right now. I haven't asked. I, in my own research, I have not addressed that problem. So, what happens? What is currently being done is that people look at this entire thing as a black box. Right. So, think of. I know how much loan has been given by the prime broker to the hedge fund. It is given. It's known. I can estimate how much quantity of asset they are holding reasonably well. Okay. This piece here, I have no clue. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just look at the revealed trading rules of this firm. And based on those trading rules, I'm going to create some kind of very simple machine learning representation of what they do. And use that as a black. Uh, that's currently what the state of the art is. Sort of almost like an inverse optimization story. I'm going to assume that the hedge funds are doing something optimal. I know what the inputs were. I know what their outputs were. I'm going to infer. It's like model identification. Neural net. Or something. Neural net, yeah. SVMs, yeah. what have you. Yeah. Uh, is that real? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Not so you have to have enough visibility how uncertain those things are. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Uh, OFR actually, which was created after the Dodd Frank bill, supposedly has the right to ask for all data. Mm -hmm. Supposedly. Not for hedge funds yet. No, no, no. Anything that gets traded on the market. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything that uh, so they can't ask yeah, the hedge fund. Uh, because that's what uh, Hillary Clinton says, right? I want to put all these hedge funds also under the same umbrella. Right now, they are not. Oh, no, no, no. Two different things. Okay. I Right now, the hedge funds don't have to reveal their strategies. But they still have, they have to reveal now what they are <coughs> holding. I see. Okay. Uh, earlier, because they were going through the prime broker, you didn't even know what the hedge fund was holding. Because everything was traded through their broker. So you didn't know whether this broker was trading for hedge fund A or hedge fund B. Now they need to get that disaggregated. Oh, I see. Okay. But why one of those are trading? They don't need to know. Okay. I mean, nobody needs to audit them, right? That could be a really powerful tool from the hedge fund perspective, actually, right? When they develop their models, um, validating the hypotheses is, a, is the major weakness. Um, right. This could help them augment their strategy based on... But, but there's a little bit of a problem. Positive feedbacks are often good for hedge funds. Right. So yeah. <laughs> that, that is the problem that the other day, right? Yeah. So there's just a, a regulator may not like it, but a hedge fund may actually like it. Yeah. And there have been cases where people hammer a stock only to buy it later. And therefore this strategy, this feedback loop is could be good. Yeah. Short sell a stock while it's being hammered and then purchase it later. Question back there. Uh, in the first part of the talk, you talked about the four axioms. axioms. Uh, actually, five of them. Yes, five. Yep. Uh, one of them that uh, I think uh, you seem to assume implicitly was full knowledge of the network. So in this one, actually, it's kind of. I would argue that you can think of this as not even a network. So perhaps, okay. If you think of my, all my risk measures, you can make it more general, are basically a function of this matrix. All right? So in some sense, not only, there is no network here. It's implicit. I'm asking for much more than just a network. I'm saying that in every scenario of the world, whatever be the network, I don't really care. You tell me what your losses are going to be. So in some sense, Although this is motivated by an underlying network, I never use a network structure. So the next piece was 
was a way to look at this one and say, let's try to open the box and see what's behind. So here, uh, the, answer, the question, the, I mean, if I were to modify your question, yes, I'm assuming that this distribution is known. Or, or the distribution, or this matrix is known. So that was my, my the, the second part of the question, really. In what situations do you know these quantities? So, assuming for the moment that all the... Let's take the case of the economy. We were talking about hedge funds and whatnot. So after the Dodd-Frank bill, um, the way they do risk management right now is that the Federal Reserve or whatever is the set of the various different regulators will go, can go to the banks and say, look, here are the scenarios. I want to know how, many, how much losses you're going to have in every scenario. So think of, and the other thing that has also happened, there's something called SIFIs, systemically important financial institutions. So there are about 10 of them in the United States. So these 10 institutions, so think of F being 10, will be given a almost like a form of scenarios and asked, tell me the losses. So assume, how many? 100? 1, uh, this is about 1,000. So the reason it's 1,000 is because there are three, three macroeconomic, I forget what the macroeconomic conditions are, but there are three macroeconomic conditions which are stressed, and it's 10 by 10 by 10. So this omega is, capital omega is about 1,000. So there are about 1,000 times 10. Assuming that they are replying correctly to all of this, in that particular scenario, we can assume that this is true. This is given. So to some extent, the reason we started with the scenario-based analysis was from this thing that after 2008, by the time 2010 rolled around, this mechanism was in place. Now, in general, what can we do? The way would be, so for example, if I wanted to do this for a supply chain, which is something that I wanted, uh, where did we go? Somewhere over there, later on. This one. So if I wanted to do a supply chain, what I would do is basically, there your question is more relevant. Do I know all my suppliers? I'm going to have to assume that I know your suppliers, or at least I know your major suppliers. The suppliers that are going to make a huge impact. And then the scenarios I could generate by just randomly stressing the inputs to those suppliers and propagating everything. Um, in the setting where I don't know what the network is, and that entity happens to be an important one. I, I was specifically know. thinking about an engineering system where the firms would be the subsystems. Yes. Your measurable would be some energy loss, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, where you may or may not have a good grasp of what's going on. So, so it depends on what your question of good grasp is. So in the sense that good grasp in the sense that what actual outcome you're going to get or good grasp as in you don't know even the distributions of the outcome that you're going to get. First, extensions exist. If you don't know what the outcomes are, you just know them within some error, you can take care of that. That's not a big deal. Um, but if you don't know anything about then it's hard. Somewhere in the middle, I've done some, I have never thought about this, but I've done some work in the past which was more driven by robust control. You could, you could transport a lot of those things here because there is enough convexity that robust control will not cause a problem. You have another sort of min or max, the relevant min, max over distribution, so that should work. Um, and get you a risk measure, perhaps pessimistic, but at least a risk measure. You could probably do that. So I would say that probably the best way to go forward would be to take some of this theory and couple it with robust control uh, and get some interesting stories out of that.